Well, good morning. Uh, I was asked last minute because Dr. Timothy Terrell's flight got canceled to uh, take his place, and I guess probably the reason Joe asked me that is that Timothy is a uh, senior fellow of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation, and I'm the founder and national spokesman for that, and so Joe probably just assumed that I would know everything that Timothy would want to say, and the reality is that I, I know absolutely nothing of what Timothy would have said. You really missed out on a great lecture, though. I'm quite positive of that, because Timothy's PhD is actually in environmentally, uh, environmental regulatory economics, and he's been focusing on that for all the years since he finished and has been a professor and so on. Uh, so I'm sure he would have done uh, a really spot-on, highly targeted lecture. Uh, I can't do that. Uh, I, I just got notified of this this morning, just before breakfast. So I'm going to try to just give you some, some basic thoughts uh, of my own. And I'm gonna, I'm, I, I want to do that by talking a little bit about what this organization that I, uh, that I founded is, is doing, why we do what we do, how it came about. The Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation, first of all, to just set aside any curiosity questions, Cornwall is not from England, right? It's from the fact that in 1999, a group of about 35 scholars on the ethics and economics of environmental stewardship gathered together at a, at a retreat center in West Cornwall, Connecticut, and spent about four days talking through those issues. And uh, after that, a, a few of us said, uh, why don't we kind of try to put together a two-page declaration of principles based on what we've discussed here? And uh, they asked me to draft that, so I did. And then after a long time of, of editing and whatnot, we came up with what we called the Cornwall Declaration on environmental stewardship. And that was initially uh, signed by uh, several hundred uh, scientists and economists and religious leaders from around the United States and eventually by over 1,500 uh, particularly religious leaders from around the world bringing a theological perspective to these, uh, these issues. Now, so uh, what is the Cornwall Alliance? It's a network of a little bit over 60 scholars, about a third of them are natural scientists, including about half a dozen climate scientists. Uh, about a third are economists, mostly economists of either environment or development. And about a third are theologians, philosophers, and ethicists. And we work to bring biblical worldview, theology, and ethics together with excellent science and economics to address questions related to environmental and developmental economics and science. Uh, our aim is to pro promote good earth stewardship and economic development for the very poor around the world and the proclamation and defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of those things interwoven together. Well, why mix those things? Well, uh, somebody actually asked me about that this morning as we were setting up our exhibit table out here, and uh, I came up with a way of saying it that I hadn't used before, and I kind of like it. Uh, it's that, you know, science tells us what is. Science is all about observation, right? Uh, and it can tell us a little bit about what can be, but it can't tell us anything about what ought to be. And economics tells us about what people do, but it doesn't necessarily tell us what people ought to do. Now, it can tell them what they need to do in order to achieve certain ends, but it can't tell them what are the ends that it needs to achieve. Theology is what addresses that issue, uh, theology from which we get morality. I did my master's in society and specialization of economic ethics under the late Dr. Russell Kirk, known often as the founder of modern American uh, conservative political philosophy. And uh, Dr. Kirk was fond of saying that the economic problem is, rated, is rooted in the political problem, the political problem is rooted in the, the uh, ethical problem, and the ethical problem is rooted in the theological problem. So we at Cornwall Alliance try to integrate all of those different, different issues together. Um, what got me into all of this in the first place really, truly extends clear back to my toddlerhood. My father was with the U.S. State Department and, and posted to Calcutta. And while we were there, my mother contracted a spinal virus, that, uh, a, a, a tropical virus that attacked her spine, and she was paralyzed for six months. She wasn't expected ever to recover, but she did. But during those six months, 
my sisters and I were farmed out. Uh, two of them were old enough to be in school, so they went to school, a school that was headed by a nun who became Mother Teresa. Uh, and my, the other sister and I were farmed out to Indian families. Each morning, very early, I would be picked up at our apartment by a, an Indian woman, my Aya, or nurse, and she would walk me the four or five blocks or so through Calcutta to the home where I would spend the day, and then she would walk me back that, uh, that night. We were out very early in the mornings. The earliest picture memories I have are of the bodies over which we stepped every morning, of the hundreds of people who would have died within just those four or five blocks of starvation and disease, and the trucks hadn't come around to pick them up yet and take them to be burned. I saw poverty, and I saw poverty at a depth that is uh, unlike what most Americans have ever, ever seen. And I saw the horrors of that, and I want to help people to avoid that. But I also have another picture memory from that period. Uh, we lived in an apartment complex, and there was a courtyard, and there was a great big tree in the middle of it, and from it hung a vine with beautiful flowers, red flowers, great big huge red flowers. And I remember looking up at those and seeing the beauty of them. And it wasn't until much later that I believe God gave me the sense to recognize that these two early picture memories from my childhood of the horrors of poverty and, the, and of the beauty of his creation could flow together in motivating me into work that would promote both simultaneously the beauty of creation, preserving pre and, and actually even enhancing that, and overcoming poverty. And what really began to bother me as I studied a lot of economics in the, starting in the early 1980s and eventually did my master's in that and then wrote a textbook in the field and a, a further textbook in the field was how many environmental writers treat, environment, or treat economic growth or economic development as a huge threat to the environment. In fact, Paul Ehrlich, the butterfly biologist, you know, he's a specialist in, in uh, reproductive habits of butterflies, uh, that's his real area of expertise. But he's the one who, who wrote the uh, book, uh, The Population Bomb, that came out in 1968. He coined a, 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 a formula called I equals PAT. Impact equals population times affluence times technology. Impact is the impact that human beings have on the environment. And by the way, for Ehrlich and other environmentalists, impact is always negative. It's always harmful. They can never think in terms of human, being, human beings doing something good to the environment, right? So impact is a function of population times affluence times technology. The more people you have, the more environmental impact you're going to do. The more affluence you have, the more damage you'll do. And the more technology you have, the more damage you will do. And the amazing thing is that so many people believed this. And the reality in history is precisely the opposite. Actually, by the, by the way, my PhD is not in economics, it's in history. Actually, the political thought of the late 17th century Scottish Covenanters. And if you want to understand the people who were real fire-breathing advocates of liberty against, against absolute government, you want to study the, the uh, Covenanters of the 17th century. But at any rate, if you look at economic history and environmental history, you discover a very simple fact. A clean, healthful, beautiful environment is a costly good. And like any other costly goods, guess what? Richer people can afford more of them than poorer people can. This is why uh, the greatest threat to the environment is not affluence, it's poverty. And the second greatest threat to the environment is government. Socialist government, tight government controls over what people do. And that's partly because socialism causes poverty, right? It doesn't help people to overcome poverty. But it's also partly because socialism deprives people of that basic incentive of property rights that both Randy and, and uh, Daniel have talked about, the basic incentive of property rights, which really gives you the answer to why you find graffiti on public bathroom walls, but not on the bathroom walls of your own home, right? <laughs> because you have an incentive to take good care of what belongs to you. So, 
uh, as I studied this, I realized that an awful lot of people were prescribing as a cure for environmental problems policies that would actually exacerbate those problems at the same time that they undermined economic development uh, for the poor. So that's why I'm involved in these things. Um, and I want to just give you a, a, a couple of basic insights here. Uh, one of them is what is typically referred to in environmental, eco environmental economics as the environmental Kuznets curve, or we also can call it the environmental transition. In the early stages of economic development, when a society goes from subsistence agriculture to early industrialization, you do indeed have an increase in emission of various different toxic chemicals into the air, into the water, into the ground, right? That, that happens. And that's more pollution, right? And we think that's a bad thing. But what's really curious is that human health and life expectancy increase at the very same time that those pollutants are increasing. Why does that happen? It's because the benefits that are derived from the polluting activities exceed the harms of the pollution. The added food, clothing, shelter, safe transportation, medical care, uh, the fact that you've got screens on your windows to keep out vectors that transmit disease and so on, these things improve human health more than the pollution harms the human health. And then, as people get wealthier and wealthier, when they realize that, you know what, I'm not worried about food on the table, clothes on the back, or a roof, a roof over the head anymore, then they say, you know what, I don't like this smog. It makes me choke. I don't like the dirty skies. I don't like the fact that our water tastes nasty and that sometimes it makes us sick. And so then they begin to be willing to spend resources to reduce the pollution. And sure enough, pretty quickly, the pollution levels peak and then they decline. And before long, those pollution levels actually go down to below what they were in the subsistence agriculture state before the industrialization. This is why America's waters today are cleaner than they were. They are less uh, filled with various diseases, not just before the 1960s, not just before the 1940s, but before the mid-1800s. This is why our air is cleaner than it's been in over 150 years. It's, this is what happens. And, and so when the environmentalists get uptight about economic development happening in poor countries around the world, I say to them, look, if you really want a clean, healthful, beautiful environment, you want that to happen instead of opposing it's happening. So that's one basic idea. Another is that, uh, that capitalism is a much better defender of, uh, of the environment than socialism is. I wrote a chapter for a book that has yet to be released. It's uh, coming out from the Institute on Faith, Work, and Economics. Um, I wrote a chapter answering the, the accusation that capitalism is harmful to the environment. And if you look at history, the history of, of disastrous environmental uh, problems, socialist countries have a far worse record than capitalist countries. Also, by the way, to push that point a little bit more, Private enterprise has a far better record than government. The worst environmental disasters in history have been done by governments, not by private enterprises. Uh, and, of course, governments can usually exempt themselves from their own laws, right? So, now, um, obviously, in a brief talk like this, I can't go into a lot of detail, but I have gone into a significant detail on this in a monograph I did called, What is the Most Important Environmental Task Facing American Christians Today? I hope it's appealing not only to Christians. And we have copies of that at our exhibit table out in the hallway. Uh, if you'll give us your name and, and email address and let us uh, subscribe you to our newsletter, you'll get a free copy of that and a couple of other issue, uh, uh, matters as well. And then I also did a major article for the World Commerce Review last year called Climate Science, Energy Policy, Poverty, and Christian Faith, How Do They Connect? And we have lots of copies of that out there as well for free. And then finally, at uh, the International Conference on Climate Change two years ago, 
uh, we interviewed over 30 of the scholars who were gathered here, climate scientists, economists, uh, uh, political uh, experts, policy experts, and so on. And we put together a documentary called uh, Where the Grass is Greener, Biblical Stewardship versus Climate Alarmism. And it covers all of these scientific, economic, and theological and ethical issues together. And that is available out there on that table. I would invite you to pick those up, and uh, they'll give you a little bit more, more insight into what I've been trying to talk to you about this morning. And now I think we're done, so Sam will come on up here and we'll have some Q&A time.